Wired Access. We'll do it live. Wired Access. Do it live! Wired Access. We'll do it live! Wired Access. Welcome everybody to Heard at Sports production of Wired Access. I'm the host, DJ K-Dub Omaha. To my right here, I have free agent, former high school football head coach. That's right. Chris Fant. I have also to my my left a what what's your position now? Strength and conditioning. Strength and conditioning yeah. coach Eli Hammonds, which is. I call Access. I don't even call him Eli or Hammonds or nothing. So I, do I get some credit for like the name Wired Access now? You do. I mean, right. that's why I spell it the way yeah. I spell it. There I mean, it is. You there know, you to go. the name, but it's Dumb because the difference that you know. I think. I think. It's weird because I wanted to go one way, but you're pulling me another, and I'm okay with that. But <laughs> the difference is how music can be involved into sports, how you guys have coached athletes at the highest stellar of athletes that have made it all the way to the NFL like your brother, yep. but all the way down to the ones that you know have the potential, but you just can't find a way to connect. And my goal is is to hopefully reach one parent one one kid, anybody that listens and says, man, I can relate to that, and now I can have something to go over that bridge to make me a better person yes, and hopefully achieve the goals that they want to achieve. You both played high school football. You played at Burke, is that correct? Yep. graduated in 2006. 2006, yep. so well before, like, the high prime of the Internet, so you won't find a lot of film in the 06, right, on the Internet No, right now. we were still VHS highlight tape. VHS, and, and DVD, nice. Yeah, they don't know nothing about that. And then, Hammonds, you're from uh, Colorado, from Colorado Springs. Springs. Yep, yep. What, uh, what was football like when you were growing up in the Colorado Springs area? Uh, I would say the comparison is actually pretty similar to, like, Denver and Colorado Springs versus Omaha and Lincoln. I would say Denver, for the most part, kind of dominated the sports scene, but then every now and then you get a little diamond in the rough out of the, the Springs area. I mean, we played uh, Reggie, ja- Reggie Jackson, obviously, is in the NBA now. Uh, Lamar Houston uh, was in the NFL for a while. So, I mean, those guys came from the Springs. So, uh, but... Uh, wasn't I wouldn't say it wasn't as as much as a grind in the springs as it was in Denver because Denver kind of just overshadowed everything. And Chris, what about you when you played back here in Omaha in 06? What was some of your biggest competition? What did you feel Burke sat in that competition? Uh, OPS was pretty powerful. Uh, we were good. Burke was a good team. Um, Central was pretty good each year. They always had them athletes, dudes playing basketball. Uh, so they always had a good little squad. Uh, North was more so up and coming at that time, but they were competing. Uh, you know, i tell you what, it was a little bit more balanced out because I remember there were times when we would play South High where we coached that together, all three of us, uh, and we would struggle when we played against Berg. But South always had some dudes that would fight. So if you beat the South High back in that time, it was, you know, 28 to 14. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like uh, Northwest was kind of what they are now. but Because you went up against talent. like a Philip Barrientos as a, at South. I remember yeah, him. Yeah, I'm, it was a couple of – they had a tight end that came out of there, yeah. a taller uh, white kid. He was a good uh, football player. I think he played at Wayne. Uh, they, uh, they, Mike Bev, he was there. He was he was a guy that I was gotcha. at uh, South. So, I mean, it was talent kind of all throughout the, the city. A lot of kids played football, basketball, and ran track. So what we did. And, and when you guys talk about growing up through high school, was there any, obviously you both went to college to play football. Was there a sport that you wish you were better at or that you were, but you took the opportunity in football instead of it growing up? I, I say it because hooper, everybody man. plays all <laughs> yeah. sports. Yeah. And you you kind of get comfortable and you find your niche, but was it the niche that you really wanted growing up? For you, Hammonds, what was yours? Uh, Mine was definitely basketball. I think basketball was definitely my first love. Grew up watching, like, Penny Hardaway. I was Penny over Jordan back in that day. Um, that's a rough. That's a rough time to swallow. <laughs> I know that's a rough comparison. Uh, Pity over Jordan. I don't even think that's man. a good really comparison. Before the well, knee I surgery, mean, uh, I mean, it was a hooper, but I, I think more. like for me, I loved Penny Hardaway just because I think it was he was kind of the underdog. Everyone liked Jordan, so the rebel in me was like, well, if anyone's gonna like Jordan, I'm gonna like I'm gonna go for Penny. Um, but uh, obviously, yes, Michael Jordan better than Penny. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I just enjoyed hooping, man, going to the park, going to uh, downtown YMCA, uh, the 24-hour fitnesses. 
Uh, just play some pickup basketball. I mean, even when we were at UNK, like, if we were not in season, I was in the rec center from, like, noon till oh, 6 o'clock. Like, Every all, weekend. Yeah. All day. So and, and fan, what it. about you? Is there any – Was I know you played basketball, mm-hmm. but was that your love? Is that where you felt like your desire was? Or Yeah, man, early on, I wanted to be just like Shaq. <laughs> yeah, that was my guy. I, I, I mimicked my game after him and everything. Where we got two Magic players here. Yeah, I love I loved Shaq, man. My mom got me an Orlando Magic sweatshirt. I thought I was him for a long time. But uh, I, mean, I, I think my first love was basketball because you play it first. Uh, at least here you couldn't start until, like, you were nine. There was no, like, real – flag football leagues or nothing like that. It was just once you hit nine, eight, eight, I think it was eight, eight, nine, ten. Once you hit that range is when you started playing football. And then uh, all through middle school and high school or uh, elementary and middle school, I liked basketball still a little bit more. And then uh, probably around my ninth grade, tenth grade year, I kind of fell in love with the game of football. Well, and when you guys talk about, like, the stuff that you fell in love with with football just as you get to the high school level, being coaches, what's some sacrifices that – you guys remember doing in the high school to get you to the college ranks that some kids might not be able to take so easy nowadays? I think from living in it and being in it on the other side of the coin, one of the biggest things is when it comes to summertime, uh, you know, we didn't miss days. You, it, it just wasn't anything you do. I know especially when I was in high school at Burke, uh, and I'm not sure how it was in the spring, but you miss, you miss a, pra- a, a workout or a practice. The dude behind you, the margin of you being better than him, in your mind, even though, like, the coach's thought process might be different, in my mind, like, this dude is a capable body, too. So if I'm not there every day working my butt off to be uh, the best at my school, I'm, I definitely don't have a shot to play. So I would say sacrificing, uh, you know, waking up early every single morning and making sure you don't miss. Hammonds, how about for you in the springs? I mean, I, I would say pretty much the same thing. Uh, even, like, the sacrificing your social time, going out to parties. Uh, because, I mean, I know at my school, even during the football season – still go uh, to the school 6 o'clock in the morning just to get some shots up, just so you can kind of keep your jumper going. Um, but then everything, like our family didn't really take vacations. It was wherever the tournament was. So I know like playing in the AAU circuit, going like Dallas and Vegas and, and you know, Minneapolis and stuff Everybody like that. Everybody else is hitting up beaches and you're hitting, hitting and up the we're, Midwest. We're hitting up tournaments. But you know what? You know, my in mom. A, in a little minivan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We had a green minivan. With a packed cooler in the back. <laughs> yeah. Uh, even for sure, like the little 13 uh, inch uh, TV with the VCR. Yeah, oh, I remember the yeah. Yeah. yeah, we had that going on. But I mean, that's. Uh, I know my mom kind of asked, like, you know, do you do we do we go too much? It's like those were some of my fondest memories, is like staying yeah. in hotels with all your friends, and like especially with the AU circuit, those are the kids who I still like call once a month just to kind of check up on them and stuff like that. So, um, but uh, otherwise, I mean, just yeah, just sacrificing time. Do you then, feel like do you feel like social media and phones sometimes takes away from those events for kids nowadays? Of the bonding and the those are your brothers and like because I mean all it takes is one kid to post something that you just don't like and you're like all of a sudden you, you don't want to be around him. Well, I yeah. mean not only that, but I mean like when you're in the hotel room, you have to provide your own entertainment. So yeah. um, I mean we're slap boxing or whatever you know, having fun, <laughs> running around doing pranks, and now I, I mean it probably just you're just chilling on your cell phone and kind of holding to yourself. Now I would hope. Obviously, that's still a little bit different, but I mean, obviously, for us growing up, I didn't get my first cell phone until eighteen. But uh, you had to, yep. you had to make your own entertainment, man. Yeah, it's just so. you and your boys in the room. <laughs> yeah. You gotta figure it out. Yeah. Whether it's Doing- gonna be fun or we're gonna be bored. Now, yeah. of course, you both have dealt with athletes that have gone through the the process of being recruited. Um, what is something that you remember from you being recruited for college football? For me, mine was a. Uh, uh, Mine was crazy because uh, I wasn't that, you know, though, I mean, it's kind of ironic because I'm in education now. And this, my journey was what kind of spurred, uh, spurred me to go into education was my recruiting started off pretty good. I mean, I was getting some uh, D1 schools like uh, the, your North Dakotas, your South Dakota states and uh, UNO. So I had some D1s and some uh, D, some pretty good D2s. And then my grades came to play. And I didn't, like, Wyoming was a school that was recruiting me, but then when they all checked my transcripts, uh, you know, it wasn't very good. I'm not shy. Y'all have heard me tell this story many times to kids. I graduated from Burke High School with 1.78. I was not the strongest student. Uh, was fighting the fact that I was a, a resource a special ed student. So once I got all that figured out, man, uh, 
So how did your parents not kick your tail? Because I know, I know mom <laughs> yeah, and dad, and, yeah. and they they don't play. They didn't, and they still held me to a high standard. But I think the uh, traveling through the journey of accepting these accommodations and this IEP, like they were, they dealt with it. Like once he gets it, we know it'll be a lifelong change for him. Okay. But they kind of let me uh, navigate through that. Now they still had expectations. Like my my stuff was one point seven eight, but don't. I wasn't failing everything. Like, you know, there were certain classes that I struggled in more than everything else, but uh, they were on me. And it, it, was a, it, was a, it was definitely good for me to go through that experience. And Hammonds, how about for you, for your, your experience of uh, recruiting? Mine was uh, definitely different. I was actually not recruited much out of high school just because I think the biggest part for me is uh, I still remember we were talking about VHSs, so I had to be back in the coach's office you know, making my own tapes, and then I would send them off. Hold on, hold on. Say that louder, because these kids nowadays, <laughs> every after every game, they got they a got new a highlight, highlight reel. Yeah. Yeah. So we had to go, yeah, go to the coach's office. You had to get yourself your own blank VCR and do it. But then as soon as I started sending off all my tapes, uh, if I did get a reply, it was, sorry, we, are, we do DVD now. And I didn't have the capabilities, so oh, the only man. time that I could really get recruited if if the coach actually came and watched watched the games, um, and uh, I mean similar to Northwest, we I had a very struggling uh, high school team, and if you did make it uh, out to the college, most of the kids quit after a week or two because they weren't really, uh, you know, ready for that college experience yet to be in like where you're having meetings and and all that stuff. So they just thought, hey, I'd go play and. And so uh, my school kind of had that image as and that they didn't really recruit us because they didn't really think we would make it, you know, yeah. uh, through through fall camp and stuff like that. So, uh, but uh, eventually, like UNK was, I, I mean, I was mainly Division Two, some NAIs. Um, I didn't want to go to school in Colorado. I wanted to get out and then uh, started thinking about being a teacher. And then uh, finally they're like, hey, man, we're running out of scholarships. You coming or what? And then I'm kind of like, uh, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Didn't even make it out to campus or nothing. And uh, so, but uh, I, I don't regret it one bit, man. Well, when you guys talk about all this, is there a position that you wish you would have played in high school that might have showcased something different for yourself, or were you in the right position? I only say this because we all three have experienced it. Mm -hmm. Your brother came from Burke to Omaha South. Mm -hmm. Who goes to Omaha South? <laughs> no football, one, not very many people. unless they know what they want. Yeah. And he got to play both ways because sometimes some people try to pigeon you, hold you into one position. What was that like for you guys growing up? You know, I should have played quarterback, right? No, nah, this, <laughs> this man, no, no. <laughs> uh, if it was me, uh, my high school was tough, and this was another reason why a lot of college coaches didn't really uh, recruit me is because they only let us go one way. I thought I had a body to be outside linebacker safety. I mean, even as a high schooler, I was six foot, two hundred, you know, twenty pounds, and could still run. Uh, but they just used me as a receiver. We didn't have a quarterback. So, I mean, it was three. My, my tape was literally three and out, three and out, catch me for a seam, maybe get a you know a touchdown or whatever, three and out, three and out. So I think if I would have played, like, safety or outside linebacker or something, that probably would have helped me out a little bit. And Chris, how about you? For me, man, I started off uh, at Burke as a fullback slash power running back and a, uh, a middle linebacker. And then my sophomore year, I got tired of sitting on the sideline, man, and uh, – during, uh, like, our scrimmages and stuff early on. So I was like, you know what? What's my easiest path to getting on the field? They said they uh, somebody got hurt. Uh, we used to coach with him, Ray Day. Yeah. Ray Day got yeah. hurt or, or, yeah, I think Good he got Ray an in, in, uh, injury. So that was my t opportunity. And that's uh, I moved. I switched there to uh, DN, and then I started playing some tight end because I started to see that they are, the fullback was just a glorified guard at Burger <laughs> High School at the time. So I was like, man, I want the rock in the my hands. The extra blocker. Yeah, so I started playing tight end, man, and uh, did well at that. Uh, liked it, enjoyed it. But I, I think those are the two that I actually fell in love with playing to. Like, there's no other feeling. Tight end was cool because you get to catch some touchdowns here and there and uh, run you against DBs that don't really want to tackle a big body anyways. <laughs> But defensive end, I got hooked with my first sack. Like when a dude's looking away and you get to run through his face or through his like his soul, if you will, through his back. I don't have frowned upon now because you don't. They don't want football to be so violent. But I, that was my thing. That, that was, was my the thing. love. Yeah. Well, and then obviously you both went to the same school. 
Did you guys get there at the same time or different times? He was one year. Yeah, I was a recruiting class uh, in front of him. Okay, so then you get one year ahead of you. What did you learn that you were able to know that the incoming freshmen were not going to know? Uh, there's a big man when you go to college you 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 the big fish in a small pond in high school you get into the college ranks everybody was good you know and and Carney when I got there they were coming off of a good season Richie Ross was there they went into the, like first or second round of the playoffs so they had high expectations we were losing uh, an all American defensive end and they had plans of me filling these shoes and all these things and so the learning curve was uh, super quick so like when the young guys were coming in. At that level, man, there is no playing around. Like you, 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 you pick up on it real quick because these are guys like this is their school on the, on, on the line. A lot of us in this time, they still taking D two players to get to the league. So people were looking at this as an opportunity for them to even make it to a, a level after that. And you had indoor football and all that other stuff. People just wanted to work hard for an opportunity. See, and I like that you say that. Like the route to get to that league, whether it's anything beyond college, does not always have to be D one. You have to find what works for you and, and where you really fit in talent-wise. Yeah. Um, and so, Ham, as you come in the year after him, what was that like coming in? And, and obviously they, they had some strong things going for them at Kearney. What was that like for you as a incoming freshman? Uh, I mean, it was an eye-opener, I guess. Like I said, I never really made it to campus beforehand. So the culture shock was probably the biggest going from a metro area to a small town in Nebraska. That was probably the hardest thing to kind of swallow. Um, but for me, I knew I was going to register right away, but I actually wanted that because I was young for my grade, so I was I was just turning 18 in fall camp. Uh, so redshirt for me was just another year to mature my body, get ready. Uh, and that also allowed me, like, people don't realize it, but if you redshirt, well, that gives you five years to finish your degree. Or you try and get your degree in three years, and you can walk out of there with a master's out of your five years. So just kind of just to soak in that college feel for it. Uh, I would say, though, the biggest difference though, in football would just be, like, the meetings. It's not just practice, but, like, fall camp, they're knocking on your door at 5 a.m. Oh, yeah. You got your meetings at 6 a.m., uh, and then you have practice at like 8 a.m. And then you go to lunch and then you have meetings and then you have practice and then you go to dinner and then you have more meetings and then you have like special teams meetings and then uh, offensive meetings and then individual meetings till about 10 o'clock. And then you go to bed. Same thing over for like two straight weeks. I think it's like <laughs> that, like that 14th day. They finally give you like that Sunday afternoon off. And it is like the best thing. Yeah. Where you can actually go out and go get something to eat or something like that. So, well, well that you guys went to Carney, so it's kind of like a small, small compact town. Yeah, but with ways to get in trouble if you wanted to. Oh yeah, oh, absolutely. What, what, what was your easiest way not to be in trouble? Was that to pretty much know that you had to be on campus, whether it's playing basketball during the off season stuff like that? What'd you do to keep yourself trying to stay out of trouble? Well, being from Nebraska for me, like I, I knew. I knew from a young age, and my parents' story for this is probably a little different. I knew I wanted to experience the party side of college, the fun side of college. So uh, I indulged. So you I mean think, like you can't spell drunk without Oh, that's a real thing. That's a real thing. That's a real thing. Your boy oh, indulged. Thanks to in, Carrie. That was the biggest thing I noticed first is when you got there, I mean, instead of like carrying your backpack, it was you got your 30 rack. And yeah. People were carrying around their 30 racks yeah. with their chew. Yeah. <laughs> Hey man, and and I, I I wanted all of that. I wanted that. I wanted that real, authentic college experience. Uh, but I say the biggest thing for me to stay out of trouble man, was it was who I surrounded myself by, around. Uh, I had some real good friends that I'm still friends with today. Uh, Ozzie Smith, he coached with us over at South. Uh, Jonathan Cannon, one of my good friends down in, uh, I think he's in Dallas now, Dallas, Texas, and uh, you know just guys that uh, one of my my roommates. Uh, Eric Meyer, this is, he was a good dude. It helped keep me out of trouble. Older. All these dudes were older than me. So uh, we just kind of hung together, man, and we had fun, and we indulged in, 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 the, in the, the college life, but we also looked out for one another. So when, you, when was the first time you two met at college? Do you remember? 
Oh, it would have been during fall camp. It would have been during fall camp, yeah. yeah. So I, I remember he, uh, I even had him give me a haircut a couple times. Maybe <laughs> yeah. me, messed up my hairline a little yeah, bit. Yeah, mess up his hairline. <laughs> my dad it's is a barber. Messed up. My dad is a barber, so I go in the car and he said, I didn't, I was, I, my biggest concern was, how am I going to look fresh for the ladies? Like, I need a haircut. <laughs> and so my dad taught me on my own head how to cut hair. I had never cut another dude's hair in my life. And then these well, dudes I think saw I was, me cut my hair. Yeah. And they were like, oh, you cut hair? I was like, sure. And they was like, come over. So my boy Jonathan, he his hair was the first cut head I ever cut. And I I, did, I mean, I didn't do great, but I didn't butcher it. You know what I mean? <laughs> so then this dude need a haircut. And I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I got to have confidence. But, yeah, I didn't do the best. What about so I've only seen you with short hair. What yeah. was the haircut back in it the was day? Still, it was still a tight fade. Yeah. Yep. 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 little blowout fade. Yeah. He, he, he rocked the Travis Kelsey before Travis Kelsey did. Yeah, that's okay. right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's right. And, and so then, obviously, Eli, you can't, you're, your stage name is Access. When did the music and how did the music fit into your football schedule? Because I always like people to understand that you can have multiple loves in life. Yep. You don't have to be stuck on one thing because that other love helps make you a stronger person. Well, I mean, speaking of finding ways to stay out of trouble, I am like the introvert in me. I was not a big party person. I think I drank maybe three times my freshman year in college. But, what a uh, nice student. <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, like my big thing was like my body is my business. And for me, if I drank... I mean, I was trying to get the most out of my freshman year as I could. So. And this is not, he is not exaggerating. This dude, <laughs> you wouldn't see him on the weekends. We have a game, we do something. We already knew where, where Eli was at. He was in his dorm room. Yep. Yeah. That a boy. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I Made mean. Made the parents uh, proud. That's so right. That, that kept me kind of out of trouble and uh, kept me, I mean, I, for me, I, I just that creative uh, side and just to kind of push push the envelope. Obviously, like sports, you're pushing the envelope through your body. But just how how can I do this with my words, or how can I express it this way? And then I had a roommate, Mikey B, uh, who also was from the Springs, and we kind of like started doing DJ stuff at first, and maybe we could do like some house parties, and we put together like mixtapes. So we go around dorm to dorm selling mixtapes, just a get some money and make some money. And, now are these and are these cassettes or these DVDs? These were actually CDs, burnt okay, CDs. Okay. Yeah, we I are have now to ask because you said era. when it came to VHS and they want to turn you down, you didn't have access. So. Yeah, and then so Mike Weird B was access. like, all of a sudden he started like spinning. Mr. Nostalgia. <laughs> <laughs> he started spinning some freestyle. Hey, man, we just, uh, we just started like recording our own music. So that's kind of how it started and then uh, just went from there. So And so then when you got to that, obviously – one thing that I've enjoyed listening to is the fact of how you take your creative mind, you put it into some words, but you do it in dedication to what you're doing. Yeah. So with your one of your first songs is uh, taking the remix of uh, Wiz Khalifa, mm -hmm. Black and Yellow, you made it for Carney. Within my town, when you see me, you know everything. Blue and yellow, blue and yellow, blue and yellow, blue and yellow. Uh, Chris, being a player, when you hear a fellow teammate bring in something like that to pump up your team, what what does that mean to the football team? Oh, it meant everything, and that was one of the times when I really like started rocking with him in the sense of like, damn, like this dude is more than just sitting in a room somewhere. Like, I think that was a way for us as a team. I know his, he, he obviously lived it, but for me, on the outside looking in and, and, and living through it in a different perspective, that was when we kind of got to see a different side of him. It wasn't the, like when, because then he would go on and throw uh, concerts where he would invite people from the Springs down to UNK, and they would rent out a bar. And he would throw a full blown concert, and then you get to see that this man is not just a talented football player. You know, and he's a white dude who could flow a little bit and can rap, and we and people liked it. So he went and made that song, man. I remember everybody being hyped. We all liked it. We all enjoyed it. I do it for the town, bro. I put them up. We do it as a team, no so We put them up. We put them up. You know, we put them up. No to the end. Yeah, we gotta. That was one that he did dedicate for the Lopers. Um, obviously, the the Wiz Khalif stuck a little hard because I mean, that song that just it hits. was a very catchy yeah. song. Yeah. Uh, so then, obviously, you guys get through college. What's your next step? What's your next step in football and life? And what's your next step in football and life? 
Man, mine was uh, when I left Carney. I had an opportunity to continue to do uh, indoor football, so I played indoor for the Omaha Beef uh, for three seasons. And then when I was looking to maybe try to go up north and go to the CFL, that's when I figured uh, we found out my wife was in, was pregnant with our oldest daughter. And all this time, I was still like going uh, to school to finish up my circuit. I wasn't quite done, like I told y'all, my schooling. I, t- I always took the long route through school, but it was what it was. So, uh, you know, a year or two in, I got my uh, teaching certification. We found out that we were going to have our first daughter, so I decided to become a teacher. Well, when you say the Omaha beef, and, and, and obviously we're here in Omaha, what, what is that like for someone that wants to become an a arena football? What, what is that dedication like? What, can you just live off of the Omaha beef stuff? Yeah, well, when I know when – and everybody, depending on the different eras, if you talk to people who play with the beef, everybody's story about the pay of it is going to be a little bit different. Uh, when I played, it was more incentive-based. Everybody signed a base contract. If you are a guy they really wanted, your base contract would be anywhere from 200 to – uh, a thousand a game, and then you had incentives on top of that. Uh, my first couple years were pretty good. My last couple years, we were b- about average. Uh, and then my last, my very last year, um, I was coaching at South at the time. Uh, we weren't very good because we, they had new ownership, and the pay was the pay was cool, but it wasn't what it used to be. So, but I mean, the route to it is, man. They 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 have people that go out and look at uh, local talent around the area of the different colleges. So when I was moving back here, a friend of mine, uh, Mike Jones, he was already playing there. Who? Uh, Mike Jones, right? That's what that, and, and, that, and he played. And that's the same, same Mike that. Jones from from uh, last week's episode. Yeah. So he told me he actually worked with my dad, ironically enough. Um, and he told my dad he was like, "Oh man, uh, uh, your son's coming back. He needed he need to come down to check out practice and all this stuff." Did that man? That was kind of all she wrote. They asked me to come in and uh, play. So we started in the Civic, finished in the uh, Rawson. I think they're still in the Rawson Arena. They are. Now they call it the Liberty Union something. Yeah. Arena. Yeah. And yeah. it's a good experience, man. Like, is it is it the NFL? No. Is it the CFL? Do you get paid that many? No. But you do still play against really, really good competition. There were dudes out there that had played in the league for three, four years or whatever. And then – for whatever reason, there's no longer there, and then come down and play. Like well, we had multiple teammates uh, that were playing for the beef that had stints in the in the NFL. You play against tackles and guards and centers. Uh, for me, as a defense, I just want to extend their career. And they played in the league. Yeah, I got you. So it was it was fun. And Hammonds, how about for you? What was yours after uh, Carney? How'd that go? Uh, I mean, it was kind of just on to the next thing, and then I was trying to find a, a job teaching as well because I was getting my certificate. Uh, I know there for a while there was even this job in Garden City, Kansas, that uh, were trying to kind of hire me at first because nobody else was. I could not get interviews nowhere, and that was kind of the most upsetting part, especially when I a student taught at Carney. Now I, I, w- I want the what year is this? This would have been 2012. So yeah. let's go back. To 10 years ago, you're saying, I couldn't even catch an interview. No. And now they're, like, begging, begging yep. for people to stay. Yeah. So when you're out there searching for interviews, what brings you to Omaha? Uh, well, I mean, my I met my wife uh, at UNK. Uh, so we were dating for about a good year. And obviously, you know, when you meet the right person, you kind of know. Uh, so I'm trying to figure out, you know, hey, what's what's our best route? And, uh, I mean, her whole family is from Omaha, so I <laughs> didn't really have a choice there, which was fine. Uh, I started actually enjoying the Nebraska life and kind of the more laid-back lifestyle. And uh, sure enough, ended up getting a phone call from OPS, interviewed, and that was all she wrote. So uh, accepted a job at Norris Middle School. Um and then as far as, like, the football, I mean, that was kind of the toughest thing. I remember, like, being in the weight room going, damn, like, what am I even lifting for? Yeah. Uh, so that was kind of a hard thing to swallow. And I know there was even times where I think you guys, the beef, were wanting some receivers, and mm-hmm. Ozzy even called me. And I was like, hi, you know, I, I'm, my days are kind of done with. And then I was focused on, that's when I was actually starting to do my music uh, quite a bit and stuff like that. So obviously you can only do so much. Well, and, and we'll take take a listen to this one right here. This is forever a Husker. I mean, the guy just said, you know, loving the Nebraska life. This here, we'll we'll play a little snippet. It'll tell you exactly what he means by that. Go big red. 
tell me what you think about that. I mean, this guy not only comes from Colorado, but he makes a song for UNK, makes a song for Forever Huskers. So we're already, I mean, if you haven't learned anything about their experiences, it's not the same but they both wanted to play football at the highest level that they could get to. Now you both are coaching at Omaha South. Mm -hmm. So what people sometimes don't realize about these OPS schools, I, I graduated from Omaha South, is these kids aren't anywhere near what you grew up with. Absolutely. Um, 90% of them don't have the support that you might have had. Mm-hmm. Um, 90% of them don't maybe never even touched a football until they came to South. What was some of the first early things that you both took in your football career as a, as a coach at a OPS school where it's not the same mentality that you grew up with and, and the fire that you had in your heart? Well, when I came in um, to OPS, you know, as a special ed teacher, I could, I, I, mine was opposite than his. I could pretty much go to whatever school because they always need sped teachers. So I chose South because I wanted, I didn't want to go back to Burke right away. I didn't want to go to like a powerhouse. I wanted to go be a part of something where I could build something from uh, the ground up, if you will. Did not know what I was walking into. I'll be a hundred percent. My cousin was teaching there uh, and I was, my mindset was I could do football anywhere. So I, my cousin was there who I look up to like an older brother. um, And I met the principal, Kara Riggs, who was a phenomenal woman. Our paths crossed there. Um, so going into that, I really didn't know what to expect. And I was still playing indoor football at the time. First thing I learned was uh, these kids are not – they did not have the same path that I took through football. Sports did not mean what it did to me in their life. So my thought process, I thought I'm coming in with people who uh, – young, young football players and young student athletes that wanted to learn it at the highest level, play at the highest level. Uh, but I learned some of them were just doing it for fun. Some of them were just doing it. Uh, to stay, you know, out of the home life or whatever the case may be. So I had to switch my uh, switch my mindset to these kids don't deserve less or half of me because they're they're deemed not good or whatever. They actually deserve more and will get more out from me because if I can help them realize how good they can be, it'll change their life for the rest of their life. And when you say that, did did it take a year or two before you realized what you were really Digging deep into my first year when we coached freshman football together, that was probably the toughest year uh, for me at South High School because um, I didn't know what I was getting into, and it, sometimes it was sometimes it was more so about finishing the game safely with these kids than it was about competing. Sometimes it was about being out there because they needed us out there to allow them to play football. Instead, of, it was big, it, it came different. It was more than winning. Like I had to take my mindset out of. Just winning. People always say, like, wow, I'm a winner. Well, you ain't going to meet a bigger competitive winner in person about winning than you will me. But Sal taught me, especially with in that, read the room, know where you are, and understand what your purpose here is here in this place. Not what your purpose is when you were a player, but your purpose here in this realm, in this environment. And, and then, of course, when you say that, you took over the head coaching job. Um, obviously, your, your brother and his. His squad is what I would call it. Mm -hmm. And I say that because these kids knew that they just wanted to play together. Yeah. They knew that each other had each other's back. They knew where where one was, the other one was. They knew that the effort was the same. What was it like going from assistant to head coach with with the squad that you've known as little kids? I mean, you've known them since they were babies pretty much. How did that feel and change your mind to help other kids build around those guys instead of knowing that they're here and we're here. I the him, him my so Noah transferring to to South from Burke. He went to Burke because he wanted to uh, follow in my footsteps to that school and play there or whatever. So then when he was coming out, uh, that was our first year coaching together. The his freshman year was my first year being a coach, and we were like we were probably one of the worst. Uh, teams with record wise and I was like ah, I don't think this is a good idea and then he played his sophomore year and I was like man and my mom and dad then it became like a real thing we, we he really wants to play for you and I'm like I don't think y'all understand man like we're losing to like other teams same caliber you know teams that schools that struggle in football we're losing to them by 35 40 points like y'all don't understand like the the, the, the how much how much talent we're missing like kids and experience I wouldn't even say talent I'd say experience 
the experience we were missing. So they, my dad said, and both of my parents looked at me and was like, uh, he wants to play for you. You guys are extremely close to one another, close to one another. And who better to coach him to get to where he wants to be than you? Well, and, and that's where Hammonds comes into the Omaha South because we had a couple a year or mm-hmm. so without him. Hammonds, what was it like to come down to Omaha South? I mean, you're at Norris. You're sitting there struggling mentally yourself with going, man, what am I lifting for? Um, yeah, people want me to play, but I don't. That, that's just not me. I'm on to the next level. What was it like to know that someone wanted you to come coach and, and be a part of something different? Uh, I mean, I kind of had the si- same mindset as him. So, I mean, I had to start. I, I came in right away being the head football coach just for the middle school. And so my thing was, in same situation to where Norris Middle School was definitely not one of the top OPS schools mm-hmm. for football. Uh, so it was just how do I kind of change this program and develop the program? And so uh, it was, I think, my fourth year. Uh, we got third in the in the cities. And uh, but I mean for that it, 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 same thing it was eye opening because Southside Omaha is soccer it's football <laughs> you know uh, what I'm saying yes uh, so uh, none of those kids have ever played football before but I mean they had some I mean they had some athletes so just kind of as a, at that level it wasn't so much yelling and screaming but just how can I get these kids to enjoy football so they will play in high school. See, and I think I think one of my biggest struggles when I was first there. Obviously, I graduated there. I went. I played high football all the way up until high school because I went and traveled from school to school to get to high school. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know anybody, and I didn't know what the process was. No one said, "Hey, here it was." So, freshman year coaching freshmen meant a lot to me because I yeah. could be that difference person in these mm-hmm. people's life to hopefully keep them involved. Yeah, because I felt just like you said, where it was. It wasn't about the wins and losses. It's how many did you finish the year with mm-hmm. that have never even experienced it. I mean, mm-hmm. not even put on a, a jock strap, let alone a, a cleat yeah. for football, and understand that there is a difference between a football cleat and a soccer cleat. Mm-hmm. They are not the same. Your yeah. ankles don't do the same thing. In That's them. right. And so then, obviously, we all get together at South. Uh, you help out with the quarterbacks. We have a lot of fun. We have a lot of experiences, but we're still having – half the effort for half the kids being so competitive. How did you feel during those times as far as successful or the opposite of going, man, I I can't succeed, even get these kids where they want to be. Yeah. I would say, man, uh, success had to be defined by a couple different areas. I was able to put together a darn good, uh, coaching staff at Omaha South. Uh, y'all know my thing is, you know, we're a team with inside of a team. Um, I think we did the best that we could to, to, to sacrifice to make sure we were all at, pract- at all the practices and all that. Thing. So what I was able, what we were able to build, uh, and I would always tell you guys, like, this ain't just about me. Like, I'm only as good as everybody else around me is. And I, I take that even into my, my, my daily life. Like, I like to surround myself with good men, especially in the coaching world, surround myself with good men. And some guys on your coaching staff may not know as much as you do, but guess what? It's my job to help you get to where you're trying to go. Uh, as a coach. So uh, of the 10 year or five years there, I looked at it as it was a successful because we left that place better than we found it. Like we left that to coach Patterson who's done more uh, positive and good things there. They started the, uh, uh, we started the junior Packers uh, and a little youth football organization. We did uh, got a lot of kids involved. We went to those summer clinics uh, or those summer, uh, the summer school little youth camps every year and got more kids involved in playing football. And wanted to come to South. Yeah. So, I mean, I thought it was successful because we, we, we won more games than the team had won in quite a while. I think our most winning the season to other people is going to be a laughable stat, but we won three, four games, whatever that was, three or four games. Uh, the year Noel uh, and Monte and uh, Jalen and those guys were seniors. Yeah. And the talent we were able to put together from what we had to collect it all from, uh, you know, it was it, it was a pretty special thing to be a part of. And for you, Hammonds, what do you what did you build your or feel like it was successful, and what did you feel was kind of a take back? I mean, it was uh, for me. I think the hardest thing was because there was a little bit of a disconnect. Obviously, us growing up, that's it was sports, and you put everything into it, and so then you kind of get into some of that coaching, and then some of the kids are kind of there just to put on the jersey and obviously yeah we're we're there to we're coaching cuz we still want to win that's why we're coaching yeah. we're competitive 
Uh, so that part kind of at least drove me crazy at first, but that was just because my ignorance of coaching was, okay, not everyone's going to be as competitive as you and wanting to win as much as you. So how can you kind of relay that and motivate those kids? So, I mean, as a coach, I had to take a step back and kind of dial in and really figure out how to motivate those kids, how to pull those kids, and just and then it is like finding the small successes. You know, like, hey, you know what, we didn't throw an interception today whatever. So, I mean, and then just kind of being able to break down the game piece by piece so then they can find more success. And obviously when you find more success, usually you're a little bit more motivated with it. So, and you develop the love for the game. So I think that was probably the biggest thing I took out of it is how can you develop the love of the game? How can you develop a culture to where you're just not looking at the wins and losses? Because at the end of the day, those kids got to go to, they got to go to school. They got to go to class. And that's probably one of the hardest places that for that team is going to school, and the whole school is just trashing on the football players. Yeah. Um, so being able to lift up their spirits and just kind of keep them motivated and keep wanting them to grind. So, so um, th- these here that they're talking about are some of the the things that are the unseen, the un unheard of, or you know, as parents, you think you know what goes on and you feel you know what go, goes on. And I, I think some of my hardest times at South was senior night. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You got five, six of us coaches not just walking once, but trying to walk twice so we made sure everybody had someone walking with Absolutely. them. Absolutely. When you look at what Burke was when you were there and you had senior night, how like how did that make you feel as a coach to know that that was not even close to the same of what you experienced of the support. It makes you feel for those kids and those young men in your program. Like, I, I, it, was, it was very foreign to me. Like, I remember when y'all told me uh, at senior night, we're all going to have to walk kids. Uh, that was foreign to me because my parents came to everything. My friends' parents came to everything. My friends' parents who whose parents weren't together or from split-up homes had multiple sets of parents, had a set parent there, had their mom and their dad there. So, uh, yeah, it was foreign. That was That was something that I had to look at as – Okay, that's when I started to realize, too, that after that first experience, we're more than just uh, football coaches to a lot of these young men. Like, we're providing them, we're, we're that, that uncle, that brother, that dad, that whatever they need us to be, that male void or that male role model that some of them, not that some of them didn't have, but sometimes they did, and sometimes we're helping their dads who couldn't be there because he's out working, yeah, trying that, to feed everybody. You I, know, that I, happens a lot, too. I think that's also something that some people don't realize is, there, there is the occasional parents that just don't make it, mm-hmm. right? But in this day and age, it is very slim for one parent to work right? and not both. And when you both work and you got young kids, older kids, one's nights, one's days. Yeah. And so I think, like, when you finally start to realize a lot of it's that way, but also then you got the flip side of some parents just don't know. Mm-hmm. They don't know what this means. They don't yeah. They, they don't live in it. Obviously, I've done everything to make sure that I was there for all my kids' uh, stuff at school, and, and, like, it's almost over. That stuff's scary. Yeah. Hammonds, what was it like in Colorado Springs? Was it was it similar to South, or was it – I mean, it was – As no, far as parents' I mean, it support? was kind of like what Chris was saying. Uh, I mean, you're, for me, especially in my home, was, I mean, your parents, you know, made sure everything was in line. They were supporting you any way they could. If mom was working, well, dad was there. Uh, and, you know, vice versa. So, uh, I mean, they knew it meant a lot to me. So, I mean, they were always, always there. So, uh, and I think that is kind of the, how we, how you can develop the culture as a school is you have a generation of parents who know the grind. Where, like, you were kind of saying, so when we were setting up meetings, hey, we're doing this and this and this, and you kind of have parents going, well, isn't that too much? And it's like, no, this is just the expectation. Like, yeah. You know what? Why y'all got to lift every day? Yeah. Yeah. Like, so. he don't get no summer? No. Not if you choose to play this game. <laughs> but you do, you but not until the afternoon. And just understanding, yeah, that you've got to, and like I said, you literally have to plan your kids, or you have to plan all your family stuff around your kids' sports. Because if they're not there, well, then you got somebody else taking his spot. See, so. and I, I think at, at, at a lot of the OPS, we were watching – I mean, I remember Myron and myself would get up at 5 o'clock. This is what some parents don't understand mm-hmm. and what, what other schools don't understand. 5 o'clock to start a double bus route. Yep. Two vans. Yep. To go all across city, not only to pick up, to and then the after. Up. Yep. Like, those are just some of the moments that if I could get to some parents to totally just 
know that, you know, take pride in whatever your kid has available, but also understand if they don't have that availability and they have other people filling in those availabilities, the sacrifices that coaches are making to get your kid to where they want to be and maybe not the parent. Well, and and I'll, I'll add to that real quick. That's a great point that you bring up. Not only do we do things like that, you know, you get a lot of where you they, they'll question parents. And, and I think it comes from a place of, them wanting to see their kids succeed or whatever, and, and that's cool. But people will question the fact that some of these coaches at these schools like South or uh, Northwest or Benson or Bryant, they question the fact of whether those coaches know the X's and O's or not, right? And, and is their knowledge as good as a guy as Bellevue West? What I have learned when it comes to some of that stuff too, that some of the unfair criticism that comes with that, it almost has to be just as good or if not maybe a little bit more in tune because if you don't, can you imagine what it looks like when you roll out 70 some or 50, 60 guys? Who have who haven't been coached during the summer or during fall camp or from week to week? We wouldn't even be them kids. We wouldn't even be. We fight. We fight our ass, our butt off sometimes just to get kids to remember formations. So we look like a football team. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Look like a class A high school football team that gets looked over. A lot of the time, look at those guys as man. I know they really work. I, that's how I look at it. They working their ass off just to fill the team, so these kids can have memories and experiences that any other school they won't get because they won't have enough room for them. Uh, they won't even play. And yep. him as well. I was just going to piggyback. I mean, even if parents can't make it to the games, it still means something to the kids to take them to and from practice. I remember taking a kid home uh, about three years ago. And, I mean, I take him home quite a bit. And then eventually one time he kind of looked at me. He's like, you ever wonder why there's two cars in the driveway and you still have to take me home? I was like, man, I just kind of ignored that. I didn't want to ask that question. And he kind of just like, you know, just kind of poured out to me a little bit. But, I mean, just little something that's – picking up your child if you're at home you know having and that's a for us that's a great way just to build i know it with my sons it's like hey you know i'm going over goals for their practice mm -hmm. on the way i mean that's a five minute conversation piece to you know establish and build that relationship so well uh, i will that makes a big difference i will get you both out on this uh what what's the obviously don't know if you're going to get back into coaching. What's what's the number one memory and the number one pride thing that you'll take away from the coaching at both, you know, uh, Omaha South, Omaha Northwest that you'll uh, cherish forever? Uh, well, I, I, I'll definitely get back into coaching. I just needed to figure, you know, see what's I, the next move's got to be the right move. You know what I'm saying for me? My kids are getting older. Uh, sometimes all that stuff we were talking about doing. I ain't got the time now. I got to. I got to be the guy taking my kid to practice. You know what I mean? I got to pick them up and drop them off. But I would say my my best memory <clears throat> from uh, South High School of coaching, uh, obviously the the experiencing the 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 signing day with my little brother and the other kids that signed to some pretty big schools out of out of South. Many more than we've ever had yeah, there. Many more than we've ever had. That was a pretty special moment. Um, I, I will tell you the, the 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 pinnacle of it all for me probably was when he got drafted in the first round. Um, coming from a kid, you know, my one my little brother, I coached him for two years. We've been coaching him pretty much his whole life. Me and my dad, um, that was a great memory. But I tell you what, man, it's a memory that keeps giving that I would say is right up underneath that, and it's when I see kids like on Hill and uh, many. Perales. Many, uh, many Look at kids. Perales yeah. boxing his way through. Yeah. Many kids, and then they see me, and they come up and say, you know, I get why you were trying to teach us all this. I understand now. I see life differently, and I really, really thank you and appreciate you. I had a kid tell me, like, what I was teaching him on the football field, he had he has a son now. It's hard to believe some of these dudes are like 24, 23, 24 years old now. Yeah, uh, and he's married. And he say he say, Coach, I run that, I run my house like you ran the football team. And I was like, Man, I hope it's not with the same language I was using, you know, because that's probably not going to be the best. But he was like, No, with the discipline and the you know the passion and the love. He was like, You know, you were hard on us, but we all knew that it came from a place of love and like you truly care. Like it was nothing fake, false, or phony about you. You were that guy that you were portraying that we all could be if we put our mind to it. So hearing things like that, those are the things that, that really give me that, that, like, all right, cool, this wasn't for no reason. God put me here for a reason, and that's what it was. I love that. Hammonds, how about you? I, you know, I don't know if I can really think of a specific one, uh, but like, kind of piggybacking off of what Chris was saying, it's just kind of the moments where you get the kids who, you know, you coached three, four years ago come back saying, hey, man, I appreciate this, this, and this. And that's just because, I mean, 
as a coach, you know you're making a difference, but you don't truly know until they're an adult. You know what I'm saying? Um, so just kind of getting that and just that affirmation, ah, you know what, I'm, this is why I am doing it, you know, making that difference. So I think that's kind of just the biggest thing for me. Well, once again, with Herd at Sports, I appreciate you joining Wired Access. We had Eli Access Hammonds. And we have Chris Fant. I appreciate your guys' story. I appreciate the time. I'm DJ K Dub Omaha. What I will get us out on this, I think my number one favorite memory and where you said the kids is there's two things. One, once you're a coach, you never lose that name. Mm-hmm. No matter if the I mean, I'm talking to players that are twenty six, twenty seven, you're still coach to them. Mm-hmm. And second thing is when we took a kid like Whole Sapple. Yep. That was Putting his arms right here as soon as the biggest guy on the field. Yeah. That no one ever thought could believe of anything, and we still got him to go to North Dakota to Mm -hmm. play football. Those are the things that you'll remember. These are coaches just like the ones on your son or daughter's team that are making that difference. You have a great time. Thanks for tuning in. We appreciate you. Heard that talk, but it's only that truth be told. On the way.